Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. People got to see how a wireless telegraph worked for the first time. All of these foods popularized, probably not invented, but also that there were these darker stories. People want to hear those complexities. You know, the United States had just colonized the Philippines, and this was supposed to show that, um, that we could improve the lives of these people. That was a choice being made, right? There were palaces in the Philippines at that time. We could have told that story. We chose to tell one story. Right. The Louisiana Purchase Exposition, known informally and better even as St. Louis's World Fair, opened on April 30, 1904. Over the eight-month period it ran, an estimated two million people experienced its many displays and special attractions, and its draw was broad. The fair drew global attention, and visitors came from near and far, like overseas far, to see it firsthand. But it was 1904. Not all people were welcomed to the exposition. In fact, many were kept out, while certain others were literally kept in. That's an important component to the St. Louis World Fair story that's missing in many folks' vision and understanding of the event. Here to talk about addressing that through a refresh of a long-running 1904 World's Fair exhibit, we welcome Jody Sowell, President and CEO of the Missouri Historical Society. Jody, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Elaine. Great to be here. Can you give us a quick breakdown, Jody, of uh, what the fair was for and what it meant for St. Louisans, Missourians, and Americans to have it take place here? Sure. So World's Fairs got started in 1851, and they really are ways for cities to show off themselves, but also to bring the world to the places that they are being held. So um, this was a chance for St. Louis to brag about its own achievements, but to show, bring the world to St. Louisans and, as you said, travelers from around the world. Mm-hmm. So um, this is a chance to show innovations. Um, but as you mentioned in the intro, it was also a chance for fair organizers to show supposed American superiority, um, even some issues of superiority of one race over another. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's also an important part of the story. Yeah. Now, the creation of the, the current version of the 1904 World's Fair exhibit, what prompted that? We have almost always had a World's Fair presence at the Missouri History Museum. Mm -hmm. The Missouri History Museum building uh, was built with funds from the World's Fair. Mm -hmm. So always an important part of our own story. Uh, So this exhibit, as you said, has been open for almost 20 years. Uh, Incredibly rare. You know, (laughs) we usually have exhibits open for nine months or a year. So I've been working at MHS for 17 years. It's been there ever since I've started working there. Right. Now, do you know, you know whether the choice of what went into the exhibit, did it reflect anything about the social or cultural mood of the early aughts here in the St. Louis area or maybe more broadly in the state? I don't know about, um, I'm certain it did because it always affects how you tell history the moment mm-hmm. that you're living in. But uh, I will say that they did try to tell some of these uh more complex stories. So you do find those in the exhibit. Mm -hmm. They are just not featured in the way we would today or explained in the way we would today. So the opening of the exhibit, it preceded your going to the Missouri Historical Society. That's true. And I I understand you came to St. Louis as a transplant. You'd been a journalist and editor. That's right. And uh, becoming a PhD candidate in American studies is how you ended up here. When you started your work for the Missouri Historical Society, because it had been just a couple years after this exhibit opened, how much of the exhibit introduced you to the St. Louis World's Fair? I I think it probably was my introduction to the 1904 World's Fair. Mm -hmm. I did not necessarily know that story coming from somewhere else. And I think, you know, people ask sometimes, why are St. Louisans still so obsessed with the World's Fair? Uh, A valid question, I think, actually, 
our sort of, um, I don't know, obsession is the right word, but Mm -hmm. our obsession with the World's Fair, I think, says a lot about St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And how much of the exhibit do you think, um, and, and the way that you came to it as someone who didn't have that same kind of familiarity, how much of it affected the way that you took in what was in the exhibit? Um, say that again, Elaine. So Sorry. Being somebody who is not from St. Louis yeah. and not having some of the um, some of the sort of organic social cultural ways that you would hear about it, how much yeah. of of your not being from here sort of affected the way that you looked at what was in the exhibit? Well, I think it is one of the ways that taught me sort of that defining characteristic of St. Louisans, which is St. Louisans are incredibly proud, and they also are incredibly critical of their own place, of their own home, of St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, it's a little bit of chicken and egg, but I think that's why the World's Fair has resonated so much. So for St. Louisans, they can say, we were once the fourth largest city in the country, the world, we had the world's attention, and then we had this decline. Mm -hmm. Now, I think both of those need to be troubled. For example, we say that we were the fourth largest city at one point, that is true, but we were much smaller than the top three. So we had about <laughs> 600,000 people, whereas Philadelphia, number three, had 1.3 million. Mm-hmm. Chicago had 1.7 million. New York had already surpassed 3 million. So we think, oh, we were at this great scale, this grand scale in 1904. But even that is more complex than most St. Louisans know. So context and perspective. <laughs> Always important. So the exhibit for this um, World's Fair uh, it opened, as you had mentioned, uh, almost 20 years ago. It was 2004. It's one of the longest running, if not the longest running? Not quite the longest. Uh-huh. Our upstairs galleries are even longer, but yes. How did conversations about updating the exhibit begin? Sure. So uh, this is one of the hardest things for museums to do. Museums have something called core galleries or signature galleries, these galleries that are supposed to tell a long piece of history and stay up for years and years and years or decades and decades. Um, so it's a very complicated process. Uh, my guess is people have been talking about uh, updating that exhibit for almost since it began, five years mm-hmm. after it began. But it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. And so now this redo of the World's Fair Gallery is actually a part of a bigger transformation of the Missouri History Museum, where we're redoing a number of our longstanding exhibits. Mm-hmm. We'll come back to that if we I have hope a, so. yeah, a thank chance you. to do so. Um, we opened with a note about who was excluded from visiting or participating in the 1904 World's Fair. Talk about that, Jody. Yeah, so you mentioned two sides, people who were excluded and then people who were there, um, if not against their will, at least not how they would have portrayed themselves. So uh, segregation at the fair is one important part of the story. Um, We do not believe that people were forbidden from going into the fair, but once people of color got into the fair, it was almost impossible to find services. So they could not get food, they could not, were not turned away at some events. And so famously, a National Association of Colored Women was supposed to have a big conference at the World's Fair, heard all these reports about people of color being turned away and said, we're not gonna meet there we're going to meet off the grounds because we refuse to be part of this. Mm -hmm. So that sort of exclusion uh, is an important part, a too often part that is left out of the story. Mm -hmm. And how is it that um, those components will be addressed in the refresh that's coming? Yeah. So they will just be addressed more directly and featured more prominently than they are currently. And that includes... um, I think people know or have heard that people were put on display during the 1904 World's Fair, uh, most famously the Philippine Reservation, um, which was one of the most popular parts of the fair to Mm -hmm. see these people. You know, the United States had just colonized the Philippines, and this was supposed to show that, um, that we could improve the lives of these people. That was a choice being made, right? There were palaces in the Philippines at that time. We could have told that story. We chose to tell one story. Right. Um, so that will just be featured more prominently, addressed more upfront. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a, a conversation earlier this year, and it was a conversation with three historians, 
and one of whom is your colleague, Cicely Hunter, the public historian for the African American History Initiative at the Missouri Historical Society. We had discussed then the ways that history is interpreted and taught through a very specifically white lens that can leave out so many perspectives of people of color. In what ways is the re-examination and reinstallation of the 1904 World's Fair exhibit incorporating um, perspectives that were previously excluded? Uh, and for instance, you know, were there community partners or are there community partners, whether that's individuals or groups that you've worked with, to make sure that the storytelling isn't sanitized or neutralized? Absolutely. So one example, I mean, we just mentioned uh, the display about the Philippines. We have worked with a Philippine-American artist who has done a lot. Her grandfather was actually at the 1904 World's Fair. He wasn't put on display. He was being one of the ushers. um, But she has done amazing art pieces to tell that story. Mm -hmm. Her home, where she lives, was on the grounds of where that display was. And so she talks about how this affected her personally. Mm -hmm. Um, So yes, partnering with people to go back and tell those stories that have been left out of the historical narrative too often is an important part of what we do. Those aren't always about race either. They're fascinating and complex stories about the 1904 World's Fair. Just just one example. Oh, sure. They had a recreation of the Boer War. So if you don't remember, the Boer War was in South Africa in the 1899 into the cent- new century. Um, they brought soldiers who were in that war to do reenactments in front of crowds of thousands. So basically to play war for the enjoyment of crowds. Right. Can you imagine us going and asking the soldiers who were involved in the Afghanistan war to come and recreate it for our enjoyment? Yeah. That's just something that you can't imagine today and an important part of the story. Are reenactments something that are unique to Americans? <laughs> Oh, I don't know about that, but um, this is a reenactment like few that I've heard of where you get the actual soldiers who were taking part to okay. uh, play war. <laughs> you might imagine there were some disagreements and, in fact, one uh, one murder, Oh, uh, which okay. happens when you put people who are battling one another into reenactment. Sure. So, yeah. We're speaking with Jody Sowell, who's the president and CEO of the Missouri, uh, Missouri Historical Society. Now, I, uh, I realized that Community engagement and conversations is something that you value, the two things that you have talked about elsewhere. How do you envision this new version of the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair exhibit showing up in like, everyday life? Right. So I think that this is, uh, you know, our tagline for this exhibit is that we are going to help you relive the wonder, but also re-examine the complexity. And I think that those are going to lead to some pretty amazing discussions. Um And those are going to happen in all sorts of ways. I mean, those will certainly happen through programs and tours. But I imagine it also happens at dinner tables after people have come to visit the exhibit. I had someone during the pandemic call me, a former St. Louisan, who said he was very angry because he had read a book about the World's Fair that talked about imperialism and racism. And he said, I grew up in St. Louis. I've heard about the World's Fair ever since I was a kid, and I've never heard these stories. Mm. Once I told him these stories, he was very open to them. He just hadn't been told them before. So I think it's going to lead to a lot of great conversations. So I am a a late transplant to St. Louis. I came as an adult. Uh, my son is a native-born St. Louisan, and I've heard just in, in conversation with folks who've grown up in this area that the 1904 World's Fair is something that they learned about and in markedly rosy hues as school kids, and to the point that you're making about this this call that you received. Is there some way that the Missouri Historical Society plans to incorporate some of its refresh components into resources that can be used in classrooms or I mean, just in sure. teaching, whether it's formally or informally? Yeah, so absolutely. So we have a rich education program that we launch with all of our exhibits, and that will be a big part of this. And, and I do think it's exactly what you say. I think I can go into our museum and ask visitors what happened in 1904. And almost all of them will say, oh, the World's Fair was here. It was when St. Louis was the fourth largest city in the country. They know those facts. I can ask about just about any other date in St. Louis history. They're not going to have an answer. Mm -hmm. So it is incredibly well known, including among young people. Um, 
But young people are also hungry for those more complex stories and mm-hmm. those more difficult stories. And all research shows that, that visitors want, they don't want to shy away from these difficulties. They want to hear those. They mm-hmm. can hold those two things in their hands at the same time. Right, right. That this was an amazing, you know, there was a, these wonderful palaces and these technological advances. People got to see how a wireless telegraph worked for the first time. All of these foods popularized, probably not invented but also that there were these darker stories. People want to hear those complexities. Mm -hmm. Is there some way that as people have become more aware of the the darker complexities that you're talking about, that they have come forward with, um, with items that they want to share with the museum in order to add to its exhibit? Or are you coming into things in a different way? Yeah, I don't know that. I don't know that we have, uh, or there's not an example that's coming to my mind. Uh, But I think as you start to talk about these more, that's a real possibility. Mm -hmm. What are some other changes that history buffs in particular can look forward to? Yeah, so I mentioned that our uh, upstairs exhibits have been open even longer than this. So they've been open for 24 years at this point. Upstairs at the Missouri History Museum in the late 2020s, we are going to have a decade-by-decade walk through St. Louis history. For every decade, you will see one of the major stories that's still impacting St. Louis, but you will also learn how people were living during that time. What were people wearing? What were people eating? What was it like to go to a dentist in the 1860s? It wasn't fun. Um, But uh, this is, we have a new collection showcase where individual objects from our collection will get to stand on their own and tell their own story Mm -hmm. because too often our collections stay in storage because they don't speak to the themes that we're talking about. Right now we have a soccer exhibit and an architecture exhibit. There are a lot of artifacts that don't fit into that. So Mm -hmm. we're going to let these stand on their own. It's all part of an effort to really connect St. Louisans to their history in a way they never have Mm -hmm. um, and to really build an attachment to this community that we think is just as much about the future as it is about the past. Right. That's a great segue to what you had touched on earlier about the the direction of the museum. Talk a little bit about that. We're increasingly talking about how a historical society can help build civic pride and civic engagement because we know that how important that is. The places with the highest uh, place attachment also have the highest local GDP, also survive natural disasters at Mm -hmm. a higher rate, also have fewer people leave them. And the way that you build that connection is making sure people understand how your place is distinctive. Mm -hmm. Not how your place is perfect, but how your place is distinctive. And that's what we are going to do. It's all part of an effort that we're talking about that we believe we can introduce you to a St. Louis you've never met, even if you've lived here all your life, just moved here recently or only passing through. So it's money and... uh Retention. Retention and, yeah. and, and, <laughs> and, and health. And, yes, exactly. Yeah. And people who live in the most connected communities also feel less lonely. And we mm-hmm. know how loneliness affects people's quality of life and literal lifespan. Yeah. Historical societies, museums can be a big part of that. So did the pandemic then sort of inform some of this as well? No. You know what really informed it was in 2014, it was the 250th anniversary of St. Louis, and we made a commitment to telling more St. Louis stories, and we saw an immediate impact, more than a 63% increase in attendance that year. Mm -hmm. We've opened eight of our 10 most visited exhibits since 2014, all of it by putting a focus on St. Louis and saying, we want to play a different role in this community than most historical societies. Mm-hmm. So the exhibit is closing this weekend. That's the true. The last so. day to see it is Sunday, April 30th. Yep. And I will, I'll try to get out there. <laughs> <laughs> Great events on both Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon. Mm-hmm. You'll see Meet Me in St. Louis on Saturday afternoon. You'll see the World's Fair in 3D on Sunday afternoon. Now, the World's Fair is obviously something that holds a very prominent and significant place in St. Louis history. As we get farther away from it, do you think it will continue to hold such a place in the public imagination? I'm better about the future than I'm better about the past than predicting the future. I'm not sure. Um, I think, though, as long as this narrative of decline do not dominate St. Louis, as much as we talk about we had this once great heyday and then we have declined, I think so. I think that's why it's important to go back and and complicate that story for people so Mm -hmm. that they realize that um, both the past and the present are more complicated than they think. Well, and as we close here, um, keeping up 
exhibits for decades and sort of preserving them the way that they are does not keep up with the way perspectives change, the way information is acquired, how history is interpreted. So will the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair exhibit, will it be updated on a, you know, a uh, a periodic, if not regular basis? Absolutely. So one feature of all of our new core and signature galleries is not just small changing pieces, but basically full exhibits within these galleries that Mm. we'd be able to change over the years to give people a reason to come back. So I believe in the 1904 World's Fair exhibit, the first exhibit is going to be about the world coming to St. Louis. But then soon, 2028 is the next time the Olympics come to America, Mm. when is a better time to talk about when they first came to the United States, which was in 1904. So I imagine in 2028, you'll see a uh, Olympics exhibit. So the chance to give multiple perspectives and tell that story in new ways every few years. Jody Sowell is president and CEO of the Missouri Historical Society. Thank you so much for coming in to talk with us about this refresh that's coming. Thank you for having me. This episode was produced by Maya Norfleet. Our audio engineer is Aaron Doerr. This podcast was mixed and edited by Aaron. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Our podcast proudly supports St. Louis artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.